Hello and welcome back to another video. So today I've got another full PC build guide for you and I'm going to be showing you how to put all the parts I've got in front of me together to get a fully working PC by the end of it. So if you've never built a PC before, you've come to the right place. So a lot of the parts I have here are quite high end. So if you do want to substitute these for some other parts, the build guide should still work pretty well for you. Okay, so let's have a look at the parts I've chosen for today's build, starting off with the case. So for the case, we've got the new Lian Li Lancool 2 mesh. So this particular case comes in two versions. There's performance and RGB, and I've got the RGB version in black. So this isn't a completely new case. It's a slightly revised version of the Lancool 2, which I've done a number of builds and a full build guide in the past. The big difference with this one is the mesh panel at the front. There's a few other changes, but that's the big one. So the idea behind that is hopefully it's going to give improved air cooling and better temperatures. And again, that's something I'm going to test when I come on to my full review of this case. For the motherboard, we've gone with MSI's X570 Creation motherboard. This is an EATX motherboard, fairly high end, and you can fit up to four M.2 SSDs and it's so perfect for content creation. To get the four M.2 SSDs you need to use their expander card so I'm going to be showing you how to do that today. For the CPU I've gone with the Ryzen 9 3900X. This has got 12 cores perfect for multitasking and content creation. Keeping that CPU cool I've got Lian Li's new Galahad AIO. So this AIO comes in 240mm and 360mm in both black and white. I've got the 360mm version in black and the reason I've gone with the 360mm version is there's space for a 360mm radiator at the front as intake which would be my preferred method of cooling in this case. For RAM I've gone with 64GB of Trident C Neo in 3600MHz speed. For storage, I've already mentioned it was going to include four M.2 SSDs in this build. I've got one uh, Gen 4 SSD, it's the Sabrent Rocket in 500 gigabyte size. And I've also got three drives from Samsung, the 970 EVO M.2 SSD, which are a Gen 3 drive, but fairly high performance. Um, as well, there's plenty of spaces in this case for SATA SSDs, and I'm going to install two SATA SSDs from Kingston the KC600, which I think is a great looking SSD and will look well on display in the back of this case. Powering the whole build, we've got an 850 watt fully modular power supply from Corsair. For case fans, I'm going to be using the Corsair LL120 fans. I think these are great looking fans and also I used them in my original high-end Lancool 2 build. So it's going to be great preparing how they perform in the new mesh case to the original Lancool 2. For the graphics card, I've gone with the ASUS ROG Strix 2080 Ti. As well as performing great, this is a great looking graphics card, I think, particularly in the vertical orientation. And I am planning to install it vertically in this case. So Lian Li offer five additional accessories for this case, and today I'm going to be showing you how to install three of them. I've already mentioned I'm going to install the graphics card vertically, and Lian Li make a specific vertical graphics card mount for this case. So I'm going to be showing you how to install that. There's an LED light strip for the front of the case and as well there's an optional USB Type-C cable for the front panel. So I'm going to show you how to install all three of those. The two accessories I'm not going to show you how to install are the hot swappable backplate for the hard drive cage and the reason for that is I'm not going to install any hard drives in this build and in fact I'm planning on removing the hard drive cage to allow for more space for cables and also improved airflow in the case. The other accessory Lian Li offer for this case is a support mount for the GPU when you install it in the horizontal orientation. Again, I'll show you how to install the graphics card horizontally as well as vertically in case you want to do that, but I'm not going to install that additional accessory. Final part, none of my bills would be complete without some custom cable extensions from CableMod and I've gone with black and white cable extensions for this particular build. Okay, so that's all the parts. Let's get on with the build. Okay, so the first thing I like to do in any build is to prepare the case. 
And by prepare the case, I mean remove any panels, dust filters, or anything else that's going to get in the way of our build. So we'll start off by removing the glass panels on the front and back of the case. So to get this glass panel off, we just need to pull the bottom panel down. And then we can reach in here and slide the glass panel out. It's held on by two hinges here, and all we need to do is lever it up. And it should just lift off. Removing the rear panel is exactly the same. And then again, it's just going to slide out and lift off. To remove the front panel, there's a little handle under here, and it's just a fairly firm pull forward, and the front panel should just pull off. There's a dust filter just on the top of the case, which should just slide off. One of the nice features about the Lancool 2 and Lancool 2 mesh is you get these two metal panels on the back, which help hide any cables. So it's going to be much easier to build if we remove these. There's a little thumb screw here, and this panel should slide out. Same thing for this panel, a thumb screw here, which we can just loosen. So the RGB version of the Lancool 2 mesh, which we have here, comes with three included RGB fans on a little removable bracket on the front of the case. So if you were planning on using an air cooler or an AIO at the top of the case, you wouldn't need to remove these. But because we're planning on putting a radiator and AIO on at the front, we're going to need to remove these fans. You may ask, why am I removing these fans and using the ones that come with the AIO? And the reason for that is there's two main types of fans. There's case fans, which are optimised for airflow, designed to push as much air through the case as possible. There's other fans which are optimised for static pressure, and these are designed to be put on heat sinks and radiators. So the fans that come with RIIO are optimised for static pressure, and they're designed to be on a radiator. These fans, although I don't have the specifications, I'm assuming they're optimised for airflow. It's very rare you get a fan that's optimised for both. There's some that are somewhere in the middle, others that are airflow focused, others that are static pressure focused. So because we are planning the radiator at the front, we should be using the ones that come with our AIO. So to make space, we're going to need to remove these fans. So the first part of removing the fans is to free up these cables, which are nicely organised via these Velcro straps. Okay, so each of the fans at the front has two cables coming from it. So a total of six cables. There's three of the cables which are designed to supply power and control the fan speed when you plug them into your motherboard. And the other three plug into this little triple adapter which is coming from the case front panel. And this allows the case front panel to control the RGB. So it allows to remove these fans, all we need to do is unplug the RGB fan cables from the triple RGB adapter which comes from the front of the case. So now we've got our fans all free, we should be able to remove the front panel. So to remove the front panel, there's two screws on each side, one at the back and one at the front, which we're going to need to remove. So we'll get rid of this back one first. And then the one at the front. So we now should be able just to tilt the front panel forward and after we've freed up each of the fan cables, be able to lift the bracket out of the case. So this removable bracket, which you can screw either your fans to or your radiator for your AIO to, is one of the really nice features about the Lancool 2 mesh. You can work away on a flat table installing your fans or your radiator and it's much easier to do that than working in the spaces of a case. And then to slip it back in, it's just a matter of slipping this into one of these wee slots at the front and securing the two screws again. You have a bit of flexibility about where you put it. There's two different heights on the front of the case, and you can install this bracket 
either this way round or this way round varying your fan position slightly as well. So you've got four different options of where your fans or radiators go on the front of the case. So your case is going to come with a box of accessories which contains the screws you're going to need to attach your motherboard to the case to secure your power supply and any SSDs or hard drives. Quite often as well you'll find some instructions in it and there's also normally some cable ties to help with cable management at the back of the case. And you generally find this inside the hard drive cage. So if we have a look, I think I can see a box down the bottom slot here. This just opens up the hard drive cage, pulls out and we've got our little box of accessories. So we open this up. Okay, so as we've mentioned, you've got some cable ties, Velcro straps, and a whole range of different screws. And your manual is going to show you what screws are designed to be used for what. So there's actually four mounting places for SSDs on the back of the case. We're also going to have M.2 SSDs installed in the motherboard. So I'm not planning on installing any traditional hard drives. Our radiator and AIO is going to be on the front. And you can imagine this hard drive cage is going to restrict some airflow coming through the case. As well as that, it's going to take up space. Our power supply is going to be installed down here where we can actually have cables sitting at the bottom of the case. So we're not planning on using it it makes sense to remove the hard drive cage, one, to allow more space for cables, and two, to help improve airflow through the case. So I'm just gonna remove these here. To get the hard drive out, the first thing we're gonna to need to do is remove this little screw here at the back of the case. Now removing this, we can then slide the hard drive to a variety of different positions in the case. So if you were gonna keep it, but you wanted it in a slightly different position, you can just move it along and then reinsert the screw. Because we want to remove it all together, we're just going to take the screw out and then if we pull the drive all the way to the side, it should slip out of this little bracket at the bottom of the case. So I find with my previous build, freeing the hard drive cage up is really straightforward, but working out where you can remove it is actually a bit more tricky. And the best place to remove it is right at the front of the case. So we can rotate it round and slide it back along to the end of the case. Now we are going to have to remove one more panel to allow us to get the hard drive cage out. Okay, so at the bottom front of the case, there's a little optional panel that we're going to need to remove to allow us to get the hard drive cage out. And the idea behind this panel is if you put a big radiator on with lots of fans extending into the case, there's room for push-pull in this case. It's obviously not going to fit, but you can lift this panel off and it allows you more space at the front. This is our hard drive cage here. Um, you can either have it slidden all the way over this way, so you're going to have all this space at the front, um, or you can remove it like we're going to do. So now we've got this off, we should just be able to slide the hard drive cage out at the front. Okay, so we can now see with our drive cage removed, we're going to have much more space at the bottom of the case for cables, particularly the power supply cables. And as well, there's going to be nothing in our way helping with our flow through the case. Now, I could put this little bracket back on now, but um, it's going to be much easier to leave it to the end. There's going to be much more space for getting the radiator in at the front, and we can put it on after the radiator goes in. I'm going to install my um, radiator in a certain way that lets me keep this little bracket on. Um, if you install it a slightly different way, you're going to actually have to remove it. And the downside to this is you're going to have a radiator which only takes up part of this space, and you're going to have a hole which you're going to be able to see all the cables in. The nice thing about this little bracket is it completely blocks out all the cables at the bottom of the case. So when this is up, you're not going to see anything. Okay, the next thing to remove is the two little brackets which sit above the power supply. So this case has two functions. There, you can actually mount hard drives on top of here, or you can have actually bottom mounted fans which are gonna help with airflow through the case. So I've already done a lot of thermal testing with the original Lancool 2, 
and having two fans at the bottom below the GPU not only improves your GPU temperatures as you would expect, bringing more cool air into the GPU, by promoting improved airflow through the case they actually improve the CPU temperatures as well. So there's already a place at the back of the case for four SSDs, we're only going to install two. So it makes sense for us to remove these brackets to improve airflow and allow us to mount two fans at the bottom of the case as intake, bringing cool air into the GPU. So each of these little brackets are held on with two screws at the front and then we should be able to just slide them out. Okay, last thing for us to do in preparing the case is to turn this little cable management bracket round. So in its current position, it's designed for ATX motherboards. We have a slightly larger motherboard, which is EATX. So we just need to turn this little bracket upside down. It's going to move this cable management cover further over to the right hand side, which is going to be because our motherboard is going to extend further over to the right. So to turn it round, we just need to remove these two screws at the top to free it up. Okay, so we should now just be able to lift this little bracket out, turn it round. And then secure it back in with the screws at the bottom this time. Okay, so there is one additional dust filter down the back of the case below the power supply and it just pulls out from the back. We're not going to need to remove it for our build because it's not going to get in the way. Just pointing out to you that it is here because you are going to need to clean it regularly throughout the life of your PC. Okay, so that's everything I want to do with the case at this stage. Next thing is to start work on the motherboard. Okay, so this is our motherboard and we want to do as much work as we can on the motherboard while it's on the table. It's much easier to work on a flat table than it is in the cramped confines of a case. So we're going to install our CPU into here, we're going to put our RAM into here, and we're going to put our M.2 SSDs into here, all before we put the motherboard into the case. So let's make a start with the CPU. Okay, so our CPU is going to go into this socket in the centre of the motherboard. To prepare the socket to receive the CPU, all we need to do is pull this little lever all the way over to the right hand side. Okay, so before we put the CPU into the socket, I want to point something out. And that's this little white mark on the top left hand corner. And if we look really closely at the socket itself, you'll see this corner has a little triangle on it. It probably won't turn out so well in the video. But take my word for it, there's a little triangle here in this black marking. And none of these other corners have the triangle. This is importantly, it's going to help you orientate the CPU in the socket. Okay, so this is the CPU. What you'll notice is I'm holding it by the side. And the reason for that is if we look at the bottom of the CPU, there's lots of little gold pins. And if we were to hold by them, we could bend the pins, rendering our CPU absolutely useless. The other thing I want to point out about the CPU, if you look at the little marking down the bottom left hand corner, and if I turn the CPU over, on the same corner, there's a little gold triangle as well. None of the other corners in the CPU have this gold triangle. So this is the corner of the CPU that we need to orientate with a little marker on our motherboard. Okay, so I've got the CPU lined up. I've got the little gold triangle here and the marking on the motherboard lined up. And all I want to do is let the CPU fall into the socket. So I'm hovering over the socket 
and you hear how it's just fallen into place. If it doesn't fall in, all you need to do is just move it around until it falls into place. It's really important you don't go pressing down on the CPU. Even now that it's properly seated in the socket, I don't want to press on it because that can damage the gold pins. To secure the CPU in the socket, all we need to do is close this little lever. And we've now installed our CPU. Okay, next thing for us to do is install the M.2 SSDs and the sockets are behind this heatsink. So it's held on with four screws, which we're going to need to remove. Okay, so we now should be able to just lift the heatsink straight off. Okay, so we've got two M.2 sockets on this motherboard. There's one here and one here. Um, importantly, the M.2 sockets aren't equal on motherboards. There's generally a faster one and a slower one. And although both these sockets have the same number of PCIe lanes, the one at the top goes straight to the CPU, while the one on the bottom needs to go through the chipset. So the one at the top is going to be the faster one out of the two, although you'll probably never notice any difference. Okay, so this is our M.2 SSD. The actual connection with the motherboard is the bit over to the right hand side, and over the left hand side, the little semicircle, is where the screw goes in to hold it in place. Okay, so before we install our M.2 SSD into the socket, it's important we make sure the little standoffs are in the right place. So we hold the SSD up to where it's going to go in, we can see that this standoff is in the right place for this drive. Now importantly these standoffs you don't screw directly into them, this one and this one, because there's little screws in the heatsink which go directly into here and secure the drive and the heatsink all in one. The one at the bottom, if we put our drive in, you'll notice that there's this standoff here that we're going to secure into. This is the one the heatsink screws into, so we're going to need to put an additional screw into this one and we're going to get that in our motherboard box. Now importantly this, these sta this standoff is in the right place and the, this one here that holds the heatsink on is also in the right place for our drives. Had we had a shorter drive we can move this standoff from here to here or here to accommodate the drive in the bottom socket. We can't move this standoff because this needed to secure the heatsink at the top but there'll be additional standoffs in the box which we can screw in here or here should we have a shorter drive for the top socket. Okay, so to install the drive into the socket, all we need to do is insert the drive at a slight angle, push it in gently, and that's installed. So when we put the heatsink onto here, the screw's gonna go through here and hold the drive into place. For our second drive, it's exactly the same process, just in at a slight angle, push in gently, and the drive slots into place. This time we are going to need to secure it with a screw because the screw from the heatsink is going to go through this standoff and not this one. Okay, so I've got the extra screw from the motherboard box. Okay, so just before we put the heatsink on, I want to point something out. I have used this motherboard before. If you're using it for the first time, there's normally a little bit of plastic protection along here and here which you should remove before the first use. So all we need to do is line this up again, and then we can secure things into place with the same four screws. Okay, so that's two of our four M.2 SSDs installed. Okay, so our additional two M.2 SSDs are going to go into this expander card. So we just need to remove the four screws on the top of it to open the card up. Okay, and we should be able to open the card up. We just need to be careful because the two ends will be held on with a cable. So we need to be careful opening that. Okay, so the process of installing the M.2 SSDs here is very similar to the motherboard. So we've got the sockets here and here. We've got three places for the standoffs here, and we just line ours up 
this standoff is already in the right place. So we could move it here or here if we had a shorter M.2 SSD. So all we need to do to install the drive is just push it gently into place at an angle. Same process with the other drive. And then we just need to secure them in place with the little screws that come in the motherboard box. Again, important to mention, if you're using this for the first time, there'll be a little bit of plastic protection over here and here, which you're going to need to remove. So all we need to do is fold this over again, taking care of the cable. That's everything lined up, and just a matter of screwing the four screws in again. Okay, so that's our expander card ready to go, and I'll show you how to use this later in the build. Okay, next thing for us to do is install our RAM, which is going to go into these four sockets here. Okay, so this is our RAM. Before we go on ahead and install it, I want to point out a couple of important features. So if you look at the gold collections along the bottom, which are the bits that are going to plug into our motherboard, and then there's a little notch between them. If you look really closely, you'll notice they're not of equal length. The one on the right hand side is slightly longer than the one on the left hand side. So this is really important when we come to plug it into our motherboard that we have it in the right way so we don't damage the RAM itself. Okay, the other important thing to point out is the motherboard has four slots for the RAM. We have four sticks of RAM, so we're not going to have a problem. We're going to occupy all four of the slots. A lot of kits only come with two slots of RAM, and you can't pick and choose which slots you put it into. Um, in this particular motherboard, if we have only two sticks, we should put it into the second slot along from the CPU and the fourth slot along from the CPU. And there's a little marking on the motherboard itself where it says first occupy this slot and this slot. So importantly, if you've only got two sticks of RAM, don't pick and choose where you put it. Slot number two and slot number four. Okay, so to prepare the motherboard to receive the RAM, we need to open up the little clips on either side of the RAM slots. Now, a lot of motherboards will only have a clip at the top and the clip at the bottom doesn't open. So just check your motherboard whether you need to open the one at the bottom as well. Next thing for us to do is to line the RAM up with the socket, taking particular care that we've got the long side of the RAM at the long side of the socket. And then it's just a matter of lining things up on both ends. And then if we push firmly down on the RAM, it should click and lock into place. And you'll notice the old clips on either side have returned to their original position. And it's just a matter then of repeating the same process with the other sticks of RAM. Okay, so we've now installed the RAM. Next step is to put the motherboard into the case. Okay, so we're now ready to put the motherboard into the case. So we look closely at the back of the case, we've got nine little standoffs. And at the moment, these standoffs are exactly where we need them to be for our motherboard, because our motherboard is an EATX motherboard. Also, had you an ATX motherboard, they would be in the perfectly in the right place as they come directly from the manufacturer. What you'll notice here, there's a code that says A for ATX, U for micro ATX, and I for ITX. And over each of the standoffs, there's a little letter. And depending on your size of your motherboard, you may need to move them. In the accessories box, you get a little um, adapter, which fits over the standoff. And then you can use a standard screwdriver to unscrew the standoffs and move them to where they need to go. But for, as I've said for us, we don't need to move them at all. Important to mention, the middle standoff looks slightly different than the rest of the standoffs. And the reason for it is it's designed to fit into the hole in the motherboard and help hold your motherboard in place before you get all the screws into place. Other motherboards, they won't actually put a screw into this one as well. It's just a, a solid standoff. In this particular one, although it looks different, you still need to put a screw into it. Final thing to mention before we put the motherboard in is this motherboard comes with the IO shield already installed. And you tend to find that in more high-end motherboards. If your motherboard comes with the IO shield separate, remember to slot it into place 
before you try and install the motherboard. Okay, so to install the motherboard, it's just a matter of sliding it in. And if you're planning to build a lot of PCs, I would recommend you invest in a screwdriver with a magnetic tip. I got this one free with my Dark Rock Pro 4 CPU color, and since having it, it's been great. It's very easy for these screws to fall as you're doing this, but the tip on it just makes it so much easier. So this is something you've got to do a fair bit. I would strongly invest you. You get yourself one of these. I, for years, used to build it with just a standard screwdriver, but this has been a real game changer. I'm not having to chase screws that have fallen that often, or if they do fall in somewhere awkward, the magnetic tip's really useful for being able to pick them up. So there's nine screws we just need to get screwed in here. Okay, so that's the motherboard installed in the case. So there's often a real temptation for people to start adding more things in at this stage. They want to install the CPU cooler and the case fans. But the next step I would really recommend doing is installing any of the case cables and power supply cables that you can. And the reason for that is once you start adding more things, particularly fans at the bottom, all these ports down the bottom in particular are going to become much more harder to plug cables into. At the moment it's fairly easy and that's why I would recommend getting as many things plugged in at this stage as you can before adding anything extra into the build. So let's make a start with the case cables. Okay so this collection of cables coming from the front I.O. panel at the top of the case are the case cables. So having a look at what we've got, we've got the HD audio cable which comes from the headphone microphone jack at the front, plugs into our motherboard obviously allowing that port to work. We've got a USB 3.0 cable. This comes the USB 3 headers. There's type A headers on the top of the case. And obviously plugging this into the motherboard allows those ports on the case to work. We're also going to plug our type C cable in shortly. And we're going to have an additional cable to plug into the motherboard as well. We've got these tricky front panel connectors. So we have a reset switch, power switch and power LED. So the reset switch and power switch obviously allow the two switches on the top to work and the power LED to light up when we've got power on the case. Looking at the other cables that we've got, so we have this triple fan RGB connector and this, this is where we unplugged the three addressable RGB fans that came with our build. And obviously there's buttons on the top of the case that allow you to control the fans. So when we install our AIO, we're going to plug the RGB cables into here and that's going to allow our case to control the fans on the front of the radiator. We've got a little short addressable RGB cable with a little protective cover. It's a three pin addressable cable and this is where we're going to plug our LED light strip into to give it power. And as well as that, we're going to be able to control it with the buttons on the case at the top. And we've also got a SATA connector which supplies power to the RGB controller on the case. And this has to be one of the most common questions I get in the comments about these builds that have built in controllers. People don't plug this into the power supply and then they wonder why the RGB on their case isn't working. Like any RGB controller and this one built into the case, if you don't power it, it's not gonna work. So we're gonna need to plug this into our power supply whenever we install it to power the controller. Final cable is we have a three pin, five volt addressable RGB cable. And if we plug this into one of the headers in our motherboard, it's gonna allow our motherboard to control the case lights. And by case lights, it basically means these two ports. This addressable RGB header that we're gonna plug our light strip into, and this triple RGB fan connector. So if we plug this into our motherboard, as well as controlling the lights via our motherboard, it's going to let our motherboard control the case lights as well. Okay, so I think before we start plugging these in, the first thing we should do is add in the Type-C cable so we can plug all the cables in at once. 
Okay, so this is the I.O. panel on the top of the case that we're going to need to remove to install the USB-C cable. So there's just a little rubber stopper here that fits into the hole. So if you're not going to install the cable, you leave this in place. So to release this panel, there's two screws, one here and one here, and the same on the back, which we're going to need to unscrew to release the I.O. panel. Okay, so that should now be freed up and we should be able to remove it. There we go. Okay, so to install the USB-C cable, all we need to do is push it into the empty slot. Now we just line it up with the front. So that sits it clicked into place. And there's a little screw here that we need to secure it with. Okay, all we need to do is put this back into the case. Okay, so we'll start by sliding the cables back through. Okay, we just line everything up again with the top of the case. And then it's just a matter of securing the two screws at the front and two at the back. Okay, so we're now ready to start plugging in the case cables. And we're going to start off with the HD audio cable. So it's important we bring each of the cables in the most sensible route to the header that they're going to reach. So the HD audio cable plugs into the far left hand side of this motherboard and it quite often does that in most motherboards. So for us it makes sense to bring it through here and up through the connection at the front of the case. Okay, so we look closely at the end of the cable, you'll notice that there's a little hole missing here. And you'll find that there is a pin missing on the socket. So it's important we line it up the right way round. So you can see the pin's missing from the top row. So I've got the cable the right way round here. And then it's just a matter of lining the pins up with the holes and pushing into place. And then we'll tuck the S6 cable down at the bottom of the case. Okay, next we've got these tricky cables to plug in. And these go down in a header in the bottom right hand side of the motherboard. These are really tricky to plug in because these all go onto the one header on the motherboard. There's a whole variety of pins and you just need to refer really closely to your motherboard manual to find out which cable goes on which pin. It gets even more tricky because this cable, if you look closely at the end of it, some of them have two pins. One is a positive and one is a negative. So what we need to do is look very closely at the back of the cables and you'll find there's a little arrow on one side. This indicates the positive. So it's important we plug it into the positive pin and not the negative pin. If we look at the um, power LED, it's actually split into two and labeled for us. So we're gonna be okay for it. But the power switch and the reset switch, we're gonna need to look for that arrow when we're lining them up. So looking at the header, we've got a row of four pins on the top and a row of five pins at the bottom. So on starting at the top row, going from left to right, we've got power LED positive and power LED negative to plug in. So positive and negative, we'll get these plugged in. Okay, so that should be the power LED plugged in. Next to that, we have the power switch and it goes positive and then negative. So it's this cable here, power switch. Positive is the one with the arrow. So we're going to install the cable with the text face down. Okay, 
Okay. And then the last one we have is the reset switch. So that is on the bottom row and it is the third and fourth pins along from the left and it actually goes negative and positive. So we're going to need to install it with the text face up. Now a little tip, I've done this wrong. Um, I have plugged the top row of cables in before the bottom row and then I can't see the bottom row so I'm going to unplug one of the top cables. I'm then going to plug in the reset switch with the text face up and then I'm going to re-plug in the power switch with the text face down. And that's both into the third and fourth pins along from the left. Okay, so that's those tricky cables plugged in. Again, you're going to need to refer closely to your motherboard manual and have the little diagram that comes in that manual open as you're plugging them in to avoid things not working when you're finished. Okay, so the next cable for us to plug in is the 3-pin 5-volt addressable RGB cable coming from the front panel. And plugging this cable in is going to allow our motherboard to sync with the front panel lighting and the motherboard to actually control that lighting. Now before we plug this cable in, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about RGB. And this is the most complicated bit of any PC build, without any doubt. So motherboards tend to have two different types of RGB headers. There's three pin, five volt addressable RGB headers, which we're going to use here. And we also have four pin, 12 volt non-addressable RGB headers. Our motherboard has both these but it's really important we plug this in to the right cable. So make real attention to your motherboard manual and make sure you're plugging in to the right place. Um, as I've mentioned, our motherboard has two of these headers. Um, we're gonna plug into the one down the bottom, keeping all the cables nice and neat and in together. So when we look at this cable, we've got three pins, which is the clue that it's the five volt header we're gonna need to plug it into, and there's a pin missing. The other thing is all these pins aren't equal, each of them does a different thing. Okay, so if we turn the cable round, what you'll notice is there's a little arrow highlighting one of the connectors, and this is highlighting the 5 volt connector. So it's important we line this arrow up with the 5 volt pin on our motherboard header. Again, if we plug it in the wrong way round, one, you're, well, you're going to struggle to plug it in because the pins won't line up, and you may damage your pins, but it's not going to work because each of these pins do a different function. Okay, so let's have a look at the header. Okay, so we look at the header, we've got two pins together, a gap and then another pin. And if we look at the manual, it tells us the pin over the left hand side is the 5 volt cable. So we're going to line the arrow up to the left hand side. And that fits because we've got two pin, two connectors on the cable, a space and then another connector. So it's just a matter of lining these up. I find these actually to be some of the more fiddly cables to plug in, but it's just take your time and try and avoid damaging the pins as you get them. Okay, so that's slotted into place. And like I say, I always struggle with these ones, getting the pins lined up, but it's just a matter of taking your time and not trying to bend the pins because you'll be in trouble if you do. Okay, next cable to install is the Type-C cable that we installed ourselves. And it goes into this socket here. So just a matter of lining things up and pushing it into place and it locks and clips into place. Okay, next cable to plug in is our USB 3.0 cable and this will allow the USB Type-A ports on the front I.O. panel to work. Now again on this cable there is a little notch on it uh, just here and it's important we line this notch up with the notch on the socket to make sure we're installing it the right way round. Like I mentioned, the addressable RGB headers is always the one I struggle to plug into. But the one you're at high risk of damaging pins on your motherboard is this cable. So take your time, make sure things are lined up the right way and don't use force. Because if you damage these pins, you're not going to be able to use that header on your motherboard. So this motherboard has actually two of these headers. We've got both down the bottom here. So we just need to plug in to one of them and then it does a little click as it locks into place.
Okay, so that's most things plugged in. We've still got this little addressable RGB cable, which we're gonna plug our LED strip into later on. When we put our power supply in, we'll plug this SATA cable into the power supply. And then we've still got this three pin um, addressable RGB connectors with proprietary Lian Li connectors on them for Lian Li fans. And we'll install our fans into here whenever we install our AIO. So that's most of the case cables done from what we can do at this stage. Next thing I would recommend doing is plugging in the power supply cables at this stage because once we start adding fans into the case, they're gonna get that bit more difficult to plug in. Okay, so I'm gonna use black and white cable extensions on cable mod to improve the look of the build. But as I mentioned, these are optional. You don't need to do this. So at this stage, if you wanna just plug in the standard cables from your power supply, you can do that instead. Um, one end of this just plugs into the motherboard like your power supply would do, and then the other end plugs into the exact same cable from the power supply. So all it does is extend the power supply cable and provide a better looking cable coming into your case, whereas the cable that doesn't look so good is hidden at the back of the case. It does create a slightly more difficult uh, cable management experience at the end of the build because you've got a longer cable, and quite often a thicker cable to manage. So we're not gonna use all the cables in this build. As you can see, we've got a 24 pin uh, power supply, which comes out at a right angle. So when we plug our cable extension in, you're not actually gonna see any of the black and white cable extension here. And I know this from my previous build in the original Landcool 2, and this particular motherboard having a cable extension for the 24 pin power supply doesn't add anything. And all it means is it's gonna be slightly more difficultly with cable management at the end of a build. And it's a bit tricky to manage the cables in this case. There is nice back panels which hide all your cables, but it's a bit tricky to get those back panels closed if you've lots of cable extensions at the back. So I'm gonna plug the standard power supply into here because I'm not gonna see it, but we are gonna see these additional power supply for the CPU cables up here. So I'm gonna use the black and white extensions for here. And if we were to start and put fans at the top, it would become much more difficult to plug these cables in. And this is why I'm recommending you do the build in this particular order. So again, if we look at these cables, there's a little notch at the top and there's a little notch on the top of the socket here. So it's important we line these up. Okay, so to plug the cable in, we've got the notch at the top, notch in the top of the socket and push and lock into place. And then what we can do is feed the excess cable out the back here. Okay, just the same process with the second cable. Your motherboard, if you've, if you've got a different motherboard, might just have one connector here. There's other ones that have an additional four pin connector, so you would really only plug in half of this cable. Um, the more powerful the motherboards get, um, the more power it's gonna demand, so therefore the more cables it's gonna need as well. Okay, let's plug the second one in. And again, that pushes and locks into place and we'll feed the additional cable out the back. Okay, what you'll notice on these cables, we've got these little black cable cones. So these help organize the cable. So we just need to slide these along to make the cables look good. We can always fiddle with them again at the end, making sure they're lined up. But that looks fine for now. Okay, so just to show you what I was talking about with the black and white 24 pin cable extension, which is gonna go into here. Had I to plug it in there, you won't actually see any of the black and white at all. So it's a waste having it here. So I'm gonna leave it out and just plug in the standard black cable that comes with the power supply. Again, there's a notch here, notch on the socket, line them up and push. And it clicks as it locks into place. Okay, so the next thing for us to install is our AIO. And this is gonna be our CPU killer. So what we have here is we've got a pump on a metal plate. We've got some tubes and a radiator. And what the pump does, it pumps water from the pump head up to the radiator where the radiator has fans on it. 
we're going to mount these on. It's going to force cool air through the radiator, cooling any hot water that's coming from the CPU. Cool water is then going to come back to the CPU and help keep it cool. That's the idea anyway. So there's a few important concepts I want to mention about AIOs because it's going to help explain why I'm doing what I'm doing. So there's two ways you can install an AIO on a case. You can have it as an intake or you can have it as an exhaust. And what that means, if you have it as an intake, it means that you're bringing cool air from outside the case through the radiator and into the case. If you have it as an exhaust, what you do is you bring air that's already in your case through the radiator and then exhaust the hot air out of the case. There's advantages and disadvantages to both, but when you're looking just at CPU temperatures, having your radiator as an intake will always give you lower CPU temperatures. And the reason for that is you're bringing cooler air in through the radiator. Um, the air is much cooler outside the PC case than it is inside the case. So if you bring cool air from outside through the radiator, you're going to have more potential to cool the hot water coming back from the CPU than you will if you bring slightly warm air that's already inside the case through the radiator and then out the back of it. So you're going to have better potential to cool the CPU. The only slight negative that you're going to have is you might run your other components in the case aren't going to run slightly hotter. For example, your GPU and the other components round about the motherboard. Because rather than exhausting hot air, the hot air is going to come into the case and then it's going to heat up those other components. I've done quite a bit of testing in this particular case and numerous other cases and I've always found that your radiator as an intake is going to do significant benefits for your CPU cooling. And yes, you are going to get a slight increase in GPU temperature and a slight increase in the other components in the case. But the benefits in keeping the CPU cool are going to be strongly outweighed by any disadvantages. So that explains why I'm going to run this radiator as an intake at the front of the case. This radiator comes, or this AIO comes in a 240 and a 360 millimeter size. We have room to fit a 360 at the front. Bigger radiator, more fans on it, three instead of the two that you're going to get in the 240 is going to mean that you're going to have more cooling potential. So that's the reason I've gone for a 360 at the front as an intake. So whether your radiator acts as an intake or exhaust depends on the direction that you put fans onto the radiator. And fans have a front, which is this side, and a back. You can tell them apart. You tend to have a nice logo on the front, nothing obstructing the fan. On the back, you tend to have these plastic plates. So it's very clear which is which. So air is going to be blown in from the front and out the back. So if we want our case to act as an intake, we need to install our fans facing this way. So this side is going to the open mesh panel at the front. The other advantage of this is we're going to get much better RGB being displayed at the front as well. The other thing to consider with radiators is you can either do a push or a pull. Um, let me show you what I mean by that. So if this is your radiator, we can still have it as an intake by doing either push or pull. So all we would need to do is put the fan on the front and then it's going to be pushing cool air through the radiator into the case. If we want to have it as a pull, we keep the fan in the same orientation and put it on the back of the radiator. So it will pull cool air in through the front of the radiator and into the case. So in general, push and pull are equally effective when it comes to cooling. Um, whether you put the fans on the front pushing air through or on the back pulling air through really depends on the aesthetics of your build. So we've got a lovely mesh panel on the front of the Land Cool 2. And I think it would be an absolute crime to put the radiator at the front. So you're not going to see any of the RGB effects through the mesh panel. So for us, it's going to be fans at the front, then radiator. So we're going to have intake through the radiator in a push configuration. Had you elected to put the fans at the back, you could also do that, but you're not going to see them through the front. 
What you can also do is push pull where you have fans on either side of the radiator. So we can put one fan on the front, pushing air, and then you can put a second fan on the back, pulling air. So these fans are importantly both in the same direction and that's going to improve your cooling. And again, I, I may well test this later in my full review and see how much benefit that gives you. But from my previous testing, it maybe gives you two to three degrees reduction in CPU temperatures under load. The thing it does add, it makes it a little bit more tricky to fit into your build. It costs a little bit more money for the fans and you're going to have a little bit more noise because you're going to have more fans. So you have to weigh up, do, do you, does that slight reduction in temperatures and the extra cost and noise, is it really worth it? Um, I'm just going to go with a push configuration, one set of fans. And the big reason for that is I want to be able to fit this little panel that we had taken off on the front to hide all the cables at the bottom. Should I do a push-pull, I'm going to have to leave that panel off. The second set of fans would really only come halfway along this, so we're going to have a hole that we have to look down and see the fans. And when I look back at my original Lancol 2 build, all the cables at the bottom were very noticeable. Okay, and a final thing I want to mention, um, we can install this radiator in this orientation with the tubes up, or we can turn it round and install it in this orientation with the tubes down in exactly the same configuration at the front. And I'm going to have to address this because there was a recent video from Gamers Nexus where he has recommended installing radiator tubes down. And the reason for that, with the radiator tubes up at the front, there's risk of air being trapped at the top of the radiator and causing noise. He has talked about other configurations where it's potentially harmful to the IIO and uh, potentially damaging to it. This isn't damaging. The only downside of installing your radiator tubes up is potentially noise. It's going to cool just as well and the lifespan is going to be just as good. I am going to install this tubes up for a very particular reason. Um, one, if we install it tubes down, we're going to have to route the cables all the way down to the bottom. It's actually quite tight. The cables on this AIO aren't the longest and we probably can get it to fit, but it's not going to look quite as good going down as it does curving and going up, which is the more traditional way to install these. The other problem it's going to give us is we're not going to be able to put this little panel on to hide the cables. So we're going to see AIO cables going down to the bottom and all the other cables at the bottom of the case. If I install it with the tubes up, it's going to look better at the top. It's not going to be under as much tension. And as well, we're going to be able to put this little panel on and hide all the cables. So that's the reason. Hopefully it will avoid some of the questions I'm going to get later on. But I guarantee you I'm going to get lots of people pointing out now um, that I've installed the radiator upside down. Okay, so I've already mentioned one of the nice things about this case is we're going to be able to install the AIO onto the bracket and then slide it into the case. So we just need to remove the original fans from the bracket so we can install our radiator and fans onto it. So each of these fans is held on with four screws which we're going to need to remove. Next thing we want to do is lay the fans on top of the radiator. We have already mentioned the direction, so we want them forcing our through the radiator and into the case, so they're going to have to go this way up. Um, what we haven't mentioned about is the cables. So we obviously want these cables to go into the back of the PC case, which is going to be this side here. Um, had we got them over here, they would be visible on the front of the case and as they stretched across to the motherboard. So it's very important that you plan things out the right way. So we set these here. Okay, and then we just need to put the long screws that come with the I.O. through the fans, through the bracket, and into the radiator. And 
important. I'm not going to over tighten things. I'm only just putting these in. Um, helps get things lined up. And again, it's not something you want to over tighten. If you over tighten fans, you can get a lot of noise and you can actually damage the radiator as well. Okay, so coming from each of the fans, we've got two different cables. We've got this four pin connector, which supplies part of the fan, allowing it to turn, and the motherboard then can control the speed of the fan via PWM. The original Lian Li fans that came in the case only had three pins, meaning that PWM wouldn't work. They would have to work by DC mode. So if you've got a four pin connector, it works by PWM. You can also run it in DC mode if you wanted to, for whatever reason. Um, the three pin connectors, you have to go into your motherboard software and make sure they're running in DC mode, because if they're running in PWM, they'll run at 100%, 100% of the time. The other connector that we have is Lian Li proprietary RGB connector. So this won't plug into any motherboard. We're gonna to have to use other cables in the box to plug it into where we need to get it to. So each of these fans, if these were case fans, you would plug each of them into a separate header on your motherboard. But because they're all on the single radiator, we want all the fans to run at the same speed. And when the motherboard wants to adjust them, it adjusts all three of the fans. So in the kit, you've got a three fan splitter, which we need to plug in. Okay, so this is the three fan splitter cable, which comes with the CPU cooler. It's got a single four pin connector here and three connectors which each of the four pin headers can plug into. This means that the motherboard can control all the fans together. So what we need to do is take each of the four pin cables and plug them in and they'll only go one way because of the little notches on the cable. Likewise another common question I get if you are using the three pin fans, I'll show you this. So this is the original fans that came in the case. So this is the RGB connector, exactly the same. These have just got three pins on them. These will plug into this connector exactly the same way. There's only one way you can plug them in because of the little notches. The additional cable, the additional pin that is for PWM isn't plugged in. So that's why you have to use DC mode for these fans. Just thought I'd show you that now. Okay, so that's one fan plugged in. We'll take the second fan and plug it in as well. And the third fan. And plug it in as well. Okay, so that means that all our fans, when we plug this into our CPU fan header, will work. At the moment they won't light up because they won't be connected to RGB because we're going to need to plug these three connectors in. So these three connectors will go into that triple fan header that was coming from the front panel that the original RGB fans plugged in to and the advantage of that is our front panel buttons are going to be able to control the fans at the front of the case. And that makes sense given that these three fans are going to be on display at the front of the case that the case buttons are going to be able to control them. I'll show you the alternative ways you have to control the RGB on these fans should you not be using this AIO in the LAN Cool 2 where you've got that nice built-in controller. Okay so the first step no matter which way we decide to do the RGB with the included kit with the cooler is we need to plug each of these three cables into a triple RGB splitter which comes with the Galahad AIO. Again line the notches up on the case
Okay, so now all three of the fans RGB is combined into this single connector, which was exactly the same connector as each of the fans had. So we need to plug this into one of two methods. Okay, so there's a little additional connector which has a very familiar pin to us. We've already plugged one of these into our motherboard. It's a three pin, five volt addressable RGB connector. And all we would need to do is plug this combined triple cable into here. So line the notches up and push. And then if we were to plug this into our motherboard, it would then allow the motherboard to control the RGB. We've got another connector on it, and this is for the pump head because it's going to have RGB as well to plug into. So the one cable is going to control the RGB from the three fans and also on the Galahad pump head. I'm just going to unplug this and show you the other option that we have as well. Okay, so Lian Li also include a controller with the Galahad AIO. So should your motherboard not have an addressable RGB header, you're going to be able to use this to add addressable RGB to your build. So all we need to do is plug this little four pin connector into the one side. And then it has the same two pins as the last cable. We've got one for the pump head and then we've got one for the fan. So we plug the fans in. Now, as I've mentioned, every, every controller is going to need power. So there's another connector that we're going to need to plug in. It has a little saddle lead at the other end and it's going to plug into this side. So we would need to plug this into the SATA cable coming from our power supply to power the controller. And if we don't do this, it's not going to work. Okay, so there are two options that's included, but given the LAN Cool 2 has its own built-in controller with the same triple cable coming from it, that's the method that we're going to use. So I'm going to go ahead and unplug these from the fans. Okay, so next thing to do is have a look at the pump head. Coming from the pump head, we've got two connectors. We've got this three pin connector, which is going to supply power and let us control the speed of the pump. And we've got this three pin RGB connector, which is very similar to the four pin ones coming from our fans, but there's only three pins. And that's why the last two lots of cables had a four pin and a three pin connector. Remember we mentioned we were going to plug the triple cable coming from our fans into here. And this three pin connector would then plug in to the one coming from the pump head. So just line the notches up and lock into place. So this would be what we would plug into if we were wanting to use the addressable RGB connector, which is probably the one I'm going to use. Okay, so alternatively, if we wanted to use the controller, coming from the controller, as well as the cable that we were going to plug into our triple connector going to our fans, there's also a little smaller three pin connector. And all we would need to do is, is plug this into the one coming from the pump head. And again, that would allow our controller to not only control the fans RGB, but the pump head RGB as well. So I think I'm going to probably use the addressable RGB connector. So I'm going to leave it plugged in. Okay, so the last cable coming from the pump head is a three pin connector. And this is going to plug into the pump fan header on the motherboard. It will support up to a four pin connector, which would allow you to control the pump speed via PWM. But because we've only got three, it's similar to the fans that come, we're going to have to use DC mode to control the pump speed. So we've got two options for powering the pump. We can obviously just plug this into our motherboard, um, into the pump header on the motherboard and use that to control the speed. And that's the best way to do it. But not every motherboard is going to have a pump header. And Lee and Lee have thought about this and they've included an additional connection in the case, should that be the case. So they've also included a SATA connector. So all we would need to do is plug this cable into the SATA connector. And then if we were to plug this cable into a SATA power cable coming from our power supply, it would allow the pump to run at 100% speed. There'd be no way for us to control it via voltage like we would if we plug it into our motherboard, but it would mean your pump would work in your case should you not have a pump fan header. Given that we do have a pump header, I'm going to leave this unplugged and plug this directly into our motherboard. Another thing to note about the pump header is that this Lian Li logo is rotatable. 
So that's important to note because you want to plan how you're going to position this in the case should it not be rotatable. So no problem here, Leanne Lee have thought about that. Okay, last thing to do before we put the I.O. into the case is to change the mounting bracket. So it comes pre-installed with an Intel mounting bracket. Our motherboard is AMD, it's an AM4 socket, so we just need to change this bracket. So to remove the bracket, all we need to do is apply pressure on this side, and it should slide out the front. Then all we need to do is take the AMD mounting bracket and slide it in exactly the same way. Okay, so that's all the way in. Importantly, remember there's no thermal paste pre-applied to this cooler. Some of them come with thermal paste pre-applied. Um, this doesn't have it, but we need to remove this bit of plastic before we install the cooler. So let's get the cooler into the case. Okay, so we just pass the pump head through the front. And then we just need to line this up. At the, you'll notice at the bottom there's these little metal pegs that stick out. We just need to line these up into one of the sockets at the front. So we've got two different heights that we can have this cooler, and I'm just going to size them both up. So that's the one that's slightly higher up. And I can also have it lower down. which the fans stick out a little bit further. So I don't think that's going to let me get the front panel closed. So I think we're going to have to go in the top slot. Okay. So the last thing we need to do is just to feed these fan cables in through the little slots at the side. And you'll notice that I've removed the triple fan splitter cable from the fans just to allow me to feed these through. And just repeat the same steps for each of the three fans. And lastly, the one at the bottom. Okay, we should be able to slide this all the way back. And then again, it's just a matter of securing this bracket in with the screw at the front and the screw at the other side. Okay, so that's the radiator mounted on the front. Next thing for us to do is install the pump head on the CPU. To do that, I find it's much easier laying the case on its back. Okay, so the CPU cooler uses the standard clips on the motherboard. We don't need to change those. So we just need to add this little bracket in here, and then we're gonna loosely tighten this on. We're gonna tighten it up fully once it's in place. Okay, so that looks fine. Just the same for the other side. Okay, so that's ready to go.
Next thing to do is to apply some thermal paste to the CPU. You'll find everybody has their own method of doing this, um, which they think is the best. My preferred method of doing this is just to add a pea size amount to the center of the CPU. And importantly, the CPU cutter comes with a little syringe of thermal paste included. Okay, so that looks about right to me. Okay, next thing for us to do, we're gonna hover the CPU block over the top and get the little clips over each of the clips in this end, and then we're gonna tighten it up. As the CPU cooler goes down, it's gonna compress the thermal paste and cover the whole of the CPU. So important, I've already decided which way I want the tubes to come in, because obviously the tubes could come at this end or this end. And I think it's gonna look best with the tubes going slightly down this way on this end. So all I'm gonna to have to do, remember to take this little plastic cover off. And then I'm gonna line this up, and try and get these clips on. Go put the bottom one on first. That's hooked on. And then we're just gonna hook it over the top. Okay, that's the top one on as well. So all we need to do now is just tighten up these screws. And it's a good idea to do each one a little bit. Move on to the next one. Because what we don't want to do is tighten too much at any one side and apply too much pressure on one side of the CPU. So a few turns of each working our way along. Okay, so that one looks to have reached its end. as has this one. Okay, so there's a little bit of plastic protection on the front of the CPU block, which we can go ahead and remove at this stage. So CPU cutter comes in a little metal magnetic plate that you can add and hide the Leanne Lee logo. I actually think it looks quite good with that on, so I'm gonna leave it off to start with and see how it goes. Okay, next thing is to plug in the additional cables. So we've got our We've got our power cable coming from the pump, which we need to plug in. So we've got the pump fan one, which is the one we're gonna to need to plug it into. So that's here. Okay, that's plugged in. All I'm gonna do is bring the excess cable up and out the top. What's gonna to go next to that is the CPU fan header. So remember the triple cable that's gonna plug into our fans. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring that in from the back and plug it in now. So it's in place when we're ready to plug our fans into it. Okay, so that's the next cable along, CPU fan header. So this is gonna be for the fans on the radiator. Okay, the last cable then that we have is the RGB header that we have plugged into our pump. Okay, I've hit a slight snag when it comes to plugging in the RGB cable coming from the pump head. Ideally, I would like to have been able to run this cable up the same way, out the back, and then back in through here because my second addressable RGB header is down the bottom left-hand side of the motherboard. Unfortunately, this cable is just too short to reach it via that route, but I can get it to go down here, alongside the RAM, out through here, back into here to reach this header. So all I'm gonna do is swap this cable coming from the front panel to over here to allow me to get this cable into here. Okay, last thing to do is to plug in the fan. So we've got our three pin splitter coming from the CPU fan header. So we need to plug each of the four pin connectors from the fans on the IO into this splitter cable. Okay, so they're, all, they're only gonna plug in one way because of the little scores on the cables. Okay, and then the last thing we need to do 
is to plug the RGB connectors coming from each of the fans into that triple cable that came with the case. So that's our three RGB cables. This is the triple case cable, so we'll go ahead and plug these in. Okay, so that's our AIO all connected up. Okay, so you can see because the way we've installed our radiator on the other side of the bracket with the bracket turned round, we should be able to fit this little panel back on again. And we can, which is nice because we're not going to be able to see the cables at the bottom of the case now. So we can just re-secure that with a single screw. Okay, so the next thing to do is to put the case fans into the build, and I'm going to use the Corsair LL120 fans for this build. And like our Lian Li fans, each of the fans has two cables coming from it. So we've got a standard four pin fan connector, which we're going to plug into the chassis fan headers on our motherboard. And one of the nice things about this motherboard is it has seven fan headers for case fans. We're only going to use five of them for these five fans. So we're not going to have any problems with that. If you don't have enough fan headers in your motherboard, you can get splitters or hubs, which are going to let you expand the number of fans. And building a PC, I think, is relatively easy. The complicated and time-consuming bit is the RGB. And Corsair use a completely different system, different connections to Lian Li. So I'll talk you through how we connect this up. Okay, so with each triple pack of Corsair LL120 fans, you're going to get a little fan hub. So each of these fan hubs allows you to connect up to six LL120 fans to it. It's numbered one, two, three, four, five, six. So you have to install the fans in order. If you're only going to use three fans, you have to occupy one, two, and three. If you do one, two, and six, it's not going to work. One and two will work, but six won't. Any break in the chain, it doesn't work. So we're going to take the additional cable from each of these fans and plug it into the hub. It says two RGB hub on the cable. So we're going to repeat this process for every one of the fans. As we talked about, hubs and controllers need power. So we've got a SATA connector. We need to plug this into our power supply when we install it. Otherwise, the hub isn't going to work. Now, our motherboard, because it's quite a high-end motherboard, it has a special connector on the motherboard where we can plug a cable directly from the end of the hub into the header on the motherboard. And this is going to make things much simpler because we're going to be able to use our motherboard software to control the Corsair fans. Most motherboards won't have this header and you're going to have to use a slightly different method. So I'll show you it now because the chances are unless you're using this motherboard, this is what you're going to have to do with the L120 fans. So we're going to have all five fans plugged into here. And then the other end of the RGB hub, we're going to plug this cable, which comes with a triple fan pack. Importantly, you need to buy a triple fan pack to get this hub and the Lighting Node Pro that we're going to use in a minute. If you just buy single fans, you're not going to be able to connect these up and get them to light up. So the other end of this, we're going to plug into the Lighting Node Pro, which comes with it. It has two different channels, channel one and channel two, which means you connect two RGB hubs. So each Lighting Node Pro can control a maximum of 12 fans, six in each hub. We're only going to use one of them, so we're just going to plug into channel one. As we already mentioned, hubs and controllers, they all require power. We're going to need to plug this SATA cable into our power supply. And then the last cable that we're going to need to plug in goes into this little bit other end of the Lighting Note Pro. And we've got a standard USB connector. So this is going to go into one of the USB headers on the bottom of our motherboard. And we've got USB 2.0 headers down the bottom of the motherboard here. We're then going to have to use Corsair's IQ software to control the fans, and that's not going to sync up with any of the rest of the software. So fortunately, with the header on this motherboard, it means we're going to be able to sync all the fans, in particular given that we've got the cable coming from the front panel into the motherboard. We're actually going to be able to use the motherboard software to sync everything up. Okay, so before we get the fans into the case, it's important that we install the fans in the right orientation so that we have got our coming through our case the way we want it to. So as we already mentioned now, there's a front of the fan, which is this side, and a back. Air is going to come in through here and out here. So each of the fans, we're going to have to be careful about where we put them. 
In general, in a case, I like to have positive pressure rather than negative pressure. So by positive pressure, I mean more air coming in than going out. And that means you have more intake fans and less fans as exhaust. If you have it the other way around, where you've got more exhaust fans, what can happen is you've got negative pressure in the case. The case is going to suck air in through the non-filtered gaps. So the likes of here and here, and you're going to end up with a case full of dust. So in general, I want to have slightly more intake or the same number of intake as exhaust. So that's the, that's the first thing to mention. The other thing is there are certain places in a case that naturally act as intake and others that naturally act as exhaust. So the fans down the bottom of the case are going to be intake fans. That reason is the GPU is going to sit on top of them. It needs a source of cool air. And this is the perfect source from underneath to get it. In fact, Lee and Lee have modified this front panel so it's now perforated in an attempt to get more air in. And for these fans then, they've taken away the top of the case. This, didn't use this in the original Lancool 2, this was actually a mesh panel. Now it's completely clear. So the idea is you're going to have an intake here bringing more cool air into your case and particularly to your GPU. So we're going to have to install these fans this way around. Just like we did in the AIO, where the cable is coming out is really important, we're going to want the cables coming out at the back of the case where we're not going to see them. So we're going to have three fans at the front as intake, another two fans at the bottom as intake. So the other three fans, we're allowed two fans at the top and one fan here. It makes sense to have these as exhaust. And again, hot air is going to rise. It's best to exhaust it out the top and the back of the case. That's just the general way most airflow will work in a PC case. So we're going to have um, five intake and three exhaust. We should have positive pressure. This can get quite complicated because fans blowing through a radiator won't give you the same amount as intake as an unobstructed exhaust fan. Again, dust filters where intake fans go through will restrict flow slightly. So it's, they don't always add up. And that's why I like to have slightly more intake than I do exhaust. Okay, so we'll get the fans into the case. Okay, so we're going to route the cables up and out the back here. And then it's just a matter of four screws to hold each of the fans on. Again, try and avoid over tightening any of the fans because it's just going to, if they're slightly out of shape, it can make them quite noisy. So most of the fan headers in this motherboard are down the bottom. So if I was to install all the fans first and then try and plug the cables into the fan headers, it could be much more tricky. So as I go, I'm going to plug the cables in, certainly the power cables in down the bottom. I'm going to leave the RGB cables at the back and plug them in at the end. Um, so we'll go ahead and plug the cable in. Okay, so you can fit two 140mm fans at the top of the case. So if you wanted to pick up Corsair LL140 fans instead for the top, that would be a sensible idea. I just have lots of LL120 fans, so it didn't make sense for me to get more 140mm fans for this build. So again, just going to pass the cables out the top. And again, we've got long slots at the top, so there's a bit of variation of where you can position the fans. I think I'm going to have them most of the way over towards the left-hand side of the case. But again, that's just your own choice of where you would like them to be. Okay, so I've only got two additional fan headers left down the bottom, so I'm going to save those for the bottom two fans. 
system fan header number one is right next to the CPU fan and pump header. So I'm going to plug into there. Okay, so because these are going to be intake fans, we're going to install them the opposite way around. So the back of the fan is going to be facing the top of the case. Now, it makes sense to plug the cables in first because once we've installed the fan, plugging the cables in is going to be a little bit more tricky. Okay, and then all I'm going to do is tuck the other cables out the back of the case as well. Okay, so if we had to install these fans like we had with all the other ones where we're screwing up and in, it would be quite a tricky process. So Leanne Leah thought of this and then included some extra long screws so we can install the fans this way round. Okay, so all our fans should now be powered, but they won't light up until we plug them into the Corsair RGB hub. So I've got five fans, so I'm going to plug them into slots one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, again, we'll plug the SATA cable in when we install our power supply. The additional cable then goes into the top of the hub. And if we're wanting to use the Lightning Node Pro, we can plug this into the Lightning Node Pro. But because our motherboard has a Corsair header, we're going to plug this straight into the motherboard and simplify the whole process. So the header is over the top right hand side of the motherboard. So I'm going to go in through here. Okay, so that's all our fans installed. Okay, next thing to install is the addressable RGB strip, which is made by Leanne Lee specifically for this case. It's going to go along the front here. I'll just line this up. Okay, so this cable we're just going to slide down the bottom here, underneath the radiator. And we're going to plug the end of this cable into this one here, which is coming from the front panel. So remove the little protector, make sure the pins are lined up the right way, the two arrows are in line, and push into place. And that locks and clicks. Okay, next thing to install is the SATA SSDs. So we've still got four places left that we can install these. We've removed the hard drive cage where we could have mounted three of these and we've removed the two little brackets to install fans at the bottom of the case which where we could have installed another two of these. But we've still got four places left so there's two little brackets on the back of the case which are going to be on display when we put the front glass panel back and we've got two down the bottom which are going to be hidden. So if you've got SSDs which don't look great, I'd recommend putting them down the bottom. If you've got ones you think look great and want to have them on display, it's a good place for them there. I think these ones from Keenston look great, so I'm going to have them on display installed in these two brackets up here. 
So first thing for us to do is just remove these little thumb screws here to slide the little plates off. Okay, so before we go ahead and mount the SSDs onto the brackets, I want to talk you through the connectors. So down the bottom of the SSD, what looks like one gold connector is actually two connectors. So we've got two little L-shaped connectors. The smaller one is a SATA data connector, which is going to allow you to transfer data from the SSD to your motherboard and the other way around. Um, the longer one is a SATA power connector, and you're going to connect this to your power supply to power the drive. So you're going to get a SATA data cable, which will come with your motherboard box. And what you want to do is check the L's line up the right way and just push it into place. This one has a little locking connector and we're going to have to squeeze this button in to allow us to unplug it. So I'm just going to show you on the table how to connect things up because once we actually go ahead and put this into the case, it's going to be harder to see. The other cable is for power. Um, it's a slightly longer L-shaped connector and this is the SATA power cable which is going to come with your power supply. So again, it's just a matter of lining the L's up and pushing it into place. And then we're going to plug the other end of this cable into our power supply whenever we install it. So I'm just going to remove those cables for now to make the process of putting it onto the little brackets that bit easier. So it's important when we put these onto the brackets, we want the connectors coming out the bottom. So it needs to go on this way round. So it's just four little screws in it. So we just turn the drive over, line the holes up and screw things into place. And again, the screws you're going to get in that motherboard accessory box. Okay, so just the same process with the other drive. Okay, let's get these into the case. Okay, so before we install the drives, I'm just going to plug the cables in because it'll be a wee bit easier. So there's the SATA power cable going in now. And then we'll get a SATA data cable as well. And again, I'm just making, making sure to line the L's up the right way. All we're going to need to do then is clip this into here. And then we can go ahead and tighten up the thumb screw. Okay, same process for the other drive. SATA power cable. SATA data cable. And then we're going to re-secure it with a thumb screw. And again, we're going to plug the power supply cables into the power supply whenever we install it. But I'm going to plug the data cables in now. So I'm going to bring these through here and bring them into the case in over here because this is the SATA cables are literally just through this gap here. Okay, so this motherboard has six SATA slots. So we're just going to plug the cables into any of the connectors here. And you hear that little click as it locks into place. Okay, next thing to install is our power supply. And as I've said, we've got a fully modular power supply. And fully modular means that none of the cables are actually plugged in. The big advantage of this is you only need to plug the cables in that you're going to need, which means you're not stuck with lots of cables plugged in that you're not using at the bottom of the case, taking up space, making cable management more difficult and potentially hindering airflow, particularly in a case like this where we've got a large front air take and lots of air coming in from underneath. 
You get other power supplies which are semi-modular, which means the main cables are plugged in automatically and you can't unplug them. And then you've got some optional cables. And then you've got cables which aren't modular at all. All the cables are plugged in. The disadvantage to this is obviously it's slightly more expensive than the semi-modular or non-modular power supplies. So a couple of points to mention before we go ahead and install this. You'll notice that we've got an intake fan here. And at the bottom of the case, we've got a vent with a dust filter on it. So we need to line this fan up with the bottom of the case. So we're going to install our power supply this way round so that it can get fresh air from the bottom of the case, which is filtered. So we don't want to install it the other way round. Now we can go ahead and plug in our cables at this stage. You can see things are labelled on the back of the power supply. So our 24 pin connector, which we've already plugged in, is these two cables. So we're going to plug that in a little bit later on because we've already installed it in the case and it's going to be easier for us to plug in once the power supply is in the case. In general, I do like to install as many of the cables as we can into the power supply before we install the power supply because once the power supply is down the bottom of the case, it's going to be much harder to plug these cables in. Okay, so starting off with our two CPU cables that we've plugged in. So we're going to need to plug two of these in. So it's labelled Type 4 on one side and CPU on the other side. So you're not going to mix these up. So we, it's going to go here and here. And then the other end of these is going to plug into the cable extensions which we've already installed. For our graphics card, it's going to have two 8-pin connectors. So one of these cables is going to supply power for both of these. So we can go on ahead and plug it in here. Now I'm going to show you how to install our M.2 expander card. It requires one 6-pin connector, so we are going to have to plug in a second PCIe cable. Okay, so we can go ahead and plug in our cable extensions for our graphics card at this stage. So if we line up the 6 and the 2 pins, and line up the notches on the connectors, and push them into place. And you can see how this will make cable management a wee bit more difficult with much more cables at the back of the case since the downside to cable extensions. And we'll plug in then the second 8-pin connector for the graphics card. So this one cable would supply both 8 pins for the graphics card, but as we're going to need a cable for the M.2 expander, I've got a 6-pin connector here. So I'm going to go ahead and plug it in just to the 6 pins on the end of here. So the other cables that we're going to need to plug in, we've got SATA cables, which we've already got two of them plugged into the case, which we're going to plug into here. And our 24-pin cable is going to plug into here, but we'll plug those in once we've got the power supply into the case. Okay, so we're going to slide our power supply into here, making sure we've got the fan facing down. Slide these cables to the side. Okay, and then there's just uh, four screws on the back to secure the power supply. And we're going to find these in with the case in that little accessory box. Okay, so we just need to plug in the additional cables. So we take the two CPU cables and join them up to the CPU extension cables. Line up the notches. And we'll just click things into place. Next thing I want to do is plug the other end of the 24 pin power cable into the power supply. And you'll notice this would be much easier if it was outside the case. So I can see where it has to go. That's one end in. And that's the other end in. 
Next thing is we have plugged two SATA cables into the SSDs already. So we'll go on ahead and plug the end of these into the power supply. So there's one. And that's the second cable. So we'll just route these in underneath. Okay, so that's all the power cables actually plugged into the power supply. We had plenty of SATA modules that we're gonna to need to plug in. And you'll notice that our SATA cables have multiple connectors. And this is another question I often get asked, you know, which of these cables do I plug into the drives? Actually, all these SATA power cables are treated equally. One will work as well as the other. So we just need to plug in each of the hubs and cases into any of these SATA connectors. So we've got our RGB hub for the Corsair fans. We're gonna plug it into here. We've got the SATA power cable for the case RGB. Okay, next thing to install is the graphics card. And while I mentioned I was ultimately gonna install this in a vertical orientation, I will show you how to install it in the horizontal orientation as well. Important to note that if we want to use our M.2 expander card, which is this here, we can only use it when the graphics card is in the horizontal orientation. And I think that's the one downside to this motherboard. You have to choose between vertical GPU and M.2 expander, and you can't have both. Um, whereas there's lots of other boards, you can actually install three M.2 SSDs in the board itself. Okay, the other thing to mention is which of the sockets we should install our graphics card into. So there's three long PCIe sockets that would be big enough to accommodate the graphics card. But it's general, it's always the top one that you want to install your graphics card into. It tends to give you the fastest speeds and the most PCIe lanes. So in general, this is where your graphics card should go. And this is exactly where we're going to install it. The M.2 expander card must go into this socket, the one below it, PCIe 5. We are going to have to configure this socket in the BIOS, and I'll show you how to do that later on. Okay, so our graphics card is going to go into the top socket, which means we're going to have to remove the second and third screw from the top. And then these little covers should just slide out. Okay, to install the graphics card, all we need to do is open this little clip here by pushing it to the right. We need to line the graphics card up with a slot. And then push it into place. And I should click and this little socket will lock over, holding it in place. Next thing to do is we just need to put the little thumb screws back in to hold the graphics card in place. Okay, our graphics card is going to need power, so we're going to need to bring our PCIe cables in from the back of the case and plug them into the two 8-pin sockets here. Okay, so again, it's just important we line up the notches, push them into place. And then again, all these cables have little combs on them to help us organize the cables. So we can do that. And then we just need to pull the excess cable out the back of the case. And again, if I was planning on keeping the graphics card in this orientation, I would have spent a lot more time organizing these cables, but we're gonna put it straight out. So I'm gonna leave the cables as they are a bit messy. So the next thing for us to do is install our M.2 expander card. And it's gonna go into the socket below. So I'm just gonna check the socket's open, which it is. 
and I'm going to need to remove, I think it's the one fifth down from the top. And it is only a one socket card, so we're only going to need to remove one of the brackets. And it's exactly the same process as installing the graphics card. We're just going to line it up with the socket. And push it in and it will lock and snap into place. We then just need to secure it in place using the thumb screw. Then we just need to pull one of the PCI extension cables in from the bottom of the case. And we'll plug it into here to power the drive. Likewise, if I was planning on leaving this, I would tidy these cables up. Right down the bottom of the card, there's a little switch. And this switch turns the fan on and off. So it's here. I would strongly recommend you leave the fan turned off. It is by far one of the noisiest fans and it will make your PC unbearable to sit next to if you leave this fan on. The SSDs in here are perfectly happy without the fan on. and They run much cooler than the SSDs do that are installed directly in the motherboard, even under a lot of work without that fan on. You can see here there's going to be lots of fans coming up from underneath, keeping them cool anyway. Um, and if you want to do something particularly labour intensive, you can of course turn it on, but I've never needed to do that. And the last time I installed this, my PC was really loud, I was hunting round, and the moment I turned this off, everything was lovely and silent. So um, if your PC is driving you mad, remember about that little switch. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and take the graphics card out, the M.2 expander out, and I'll show you how to install the graphics card in its vertical orientation. Okay, so this is the Lian Li Lan Co vertical GPU mount. It comes in two parts. We've got the main part, but we've got this little additional bracket, which can go in two places. And this is because the graphics card can be installed at two different heights, depending on whether or not you've installed the fan to the bottom of the case. If you haven't, you'll want the graphics card all the way down the bottom. And if you have, you need it lifted up a little bit in the bracket. So you haven't installed it, what you're going to want to do is install this little extra bracket at the top of the graphics card mount and then put two little screws through here. In our case we have the fans at the bottom, so why you need to install this at the bottom of the mount, lifting it up a little bit in height. So we just add this onto here and we need to put two little screws in through here. Now I've installed a number of these in different cases and I've always found the easiest way to install them is actually to go ahead and put the graphics card into the bracket, secure it and then put the whole thing into the case in one go. So installing it is exactly the same way, we need just to open this little clip and then we just need to lift up the graphics card, line it up with the slot and slide it into place. So you can hear it's clicked and locked into place. And then again, we just need to take the two little thumb screws that we have already removed from the case and put them into here to secure the graphics card into place. Okay, so we're now ready to get this into the case. Okay, and the next thing I like to do is to plug the cable in while we're supporting the graphics card. So making sure the socket's open. So we can rest this in the case. Take our cable. And push it into place. That's now locked into place. We take our graphics card then. Put a slight bend in the cable. And then we're just going to slide it into place. So there we go, that's it where it needs to be. And we've got three little holes here where we just need to secure the original thumb screws to keep the graphics card where it needs to be.
Then the last thing for us to do is to plug in the power supply cables. Okay, and then we'll just tidy up the cables. Okay, so now we come to my least favorite part of any build, and that is cable management. So we need to tidy this mess of cables up. There's lots of Velcro strapping points here. There's lots of other places where we can attach cable ties, get everything tidied up. Lots of room onto the front of the case here for cables as well. And then we can get the panels back on and get the back of the case closed. Okay, so you can see one of the big advantages of the Landcool 2 mesh on the Landcool 2 is that these nice back plates cover all the cables in the back of the case really well, but yet you can still leave your hard drives on display. So the last thing for us to do is replace all the panels and dust filters. Okay, so that's the PC complete. We're now ready to flip the power switch and see if we get a boot screen. Importantly, before we do that, we have one more step. We need to plug in a Windows Bootable 10 USB drive. If you don't know how to make one of these, I've made a video on how to create one, so I'll put a link to it in the description. So let's plug this in and power up the PC. Okay, moment of truth. So that's good, we've got lights and the fans are spinning. So we just need to wait and see if we get a boot screen on the monitor. So that's a good sign, we've got the, the logo coming up. And now the next thing we're waiting for is the Windows logo. And uh, the computer is hopefully going to find the Windows bootable drive and boot off it because obviously our hard drives at the moment don't have an operating system installed on them. And it can often take a little minute before that happens. So the next thing we're going to see is the Windows logo and then hopefully we're going to see the Windows install screen appearing. So there we go, perfect. We've got the Windows install screen. So I'm going to take you through setting this up step by step and what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip over to the screen mode to give you a better view of everything. Okay so we're in the United Kingdom so we're just going to go ahead and click next and we're going to click install now. If you've got a Windows 10 product key you can go ahead and enter it now. 
If you don't click, I don't have a product key. And then you can select which version of Windows you're gonna get a product key for in the future. So I'm gonna click Windows 10 Pro and hit Next. Okay, so we now need to select which of the four available drives we want to install Windows on. For those of you who watched the video closely, you'll notice that I have removed my 500 gigabyte Savant Rocket drive. And the reason for that is that's where my current build is saved onto. I've done a lot of work setting the PC up the way I wanted to, so I don't want to wipe that and start again. So I've added an extra Samsung one terabyte drive, uh, M.2 drive into the build. So we've got two Samsung one terabyte M.2 drives, and we've still got our two 500 gigabyte Kingston SATA SSDs. You never get the full amount of space on a disk when you're buying it, so don't expect to buy a one terabyte drive and expect one terabyte of space in it. There's always a little bit less than what's advertised, what you actually get to store onto. So I would recommend installing it an M.2 SSD. If I had my Gen 4 drive plugged in, I would recommend installing Windows onto that, um, which is what I have done, and that's the reason I have removed it, because I don't want to wipe my Windows install. So I'm going to select one of the Samsung one terabyte drives, so we'll pick drive two, and all we need to do is click Next. Windows is now going to take a little while getting files copied across and set up so this will take a bit of time, and your computer is likely to switch off a couple of times during the initial install. Okay, so we're now ready to set up Windows. Um, I'm going to pick certain options during the install. If you have any different preferences, go on ahead and select whatever options you want. So we're in the United Kingdom. I'm going to click Yes. It's the United Kingdom keyboard, so Yes. And I don't want a secondary keyboard, so I'm going to click Skip. Okay, I'm going to set this up for personal use. Click Next. And then I need to put my Microsoft account uh, username in. Okay, I can create a PIN code to log in with. And click OK. Um, again, I'm going to pick some options here. Again, if you have different options, go ahead and select them. So I do want uh, online speech recognition. Um, I don't want location-based services, and I don't want to find my device. I'm just going to send basic diagnostic data, no de-inking, no again, no again. Um, and I'm going to select no to this. Okay, if you've got an Android phone, you can go ahead and put it in here. Um, I'm going to select do this later. And I'm going to select only save files to this PC. Uh, no thanks. And not now. Okay, so that's Windows installed. It can be really tempting now to go in and start installing the drivers and programs that you're going to need. But what I would recommend doing is updating Windows fully before we do that. So let's go ahead and do that first. So if we go down and click the Windows icon in the bottom left hand corner. And then go to the settings. And we're going to go to updates and security. And we're going to go check for updates. And what we're going to do is we're going to, Windows is going to find updates, it's going to download them. We're going to let it install them. The computer may need to be switched off a number of times and restarted, but we're going to complete this until there's no more updates available.
Okay, so that's Windows fully up to date. There is no more updates available. So the next thing I like to do is to get all the SSDs or hard drives to show up. Because if we go in and look at my PC, uh, the chances are there's only the one drive which we've installed Windows on showing up. So I'll show you how to get all the rest of the drives showing up. Okay, click the Windows icon and then we'll click the Documents. Click this PC. And as you can see, drives and devices, we've only got the local disk C showing up. So to fix that, we need to go down to the bottom in the search bar and type disk management in. And the control panel option for create and format hard disk partitions will come up, so we'll click on that. So it's now going to, we're going to get a little pop-up asking us to initialize disks. So it's saying we must initialize a disk before it's going to work. So we're going to select OK. Okay, so we can now see our drives. We've got disk zero and disk one, which are going to be our Kingston 500 gigabyte SATA SSDs. And we'll work our way down. We've got disk two, which is where we installed our operating system on, and disk three. Um, so the three disks, they're now showing up, but they're in unallocated spaces. So we're going to have to go ahead and format them before we can use them. So if we right click, on the unallocated space and click new simple volume. Hit next, next. So we can go on ahead and sign the drive a letter. This is pick D. I have no reason to change that, so I'm gonna leave it as it is. Click next and we can give it a name. So we're gonna call it KC600A and hit next and finish. Okay, so the drive is now showing up and partitioned. So we're going to repeat the same step for disk one. New simple volume, next, next. It's pick D, we'll leave it as E. And we're going to call it KC600B. Hit next, finish. Down to disk three, the unallocated space. Right click, new simple volume, next. Next, it's called that F, we'll leave it as that. And we're gonna call it Samson Evo 970B and click next. Okay, and if we go back up to our drive that we already formatted, you'll see it doesn't have a name, it's just down a C. So we can right click on it and click on properties and then we can type a name. So we'll call it Samson Evo 970A and click OK. OK, so we close this down and we go back now to our main screen. We've got Four disks now showing up. We've got our two M.2 SSDs, Samsung Evo 970A, Samsung Evo 970B, and we've got our two SATA SSDs, KC600A and KC600B. So they're now available to use. Okay, next thing to do is to install any essential drivers or programs we're gonna to need to use the PC. Okay, so we'll head over to MSI's website and there's a support section for every motherboard that they sell. And under this, you'll get a section driver. So we're gonna have a look and see what's on offer. We've got some LAN drivers. So we'll go ahead and download and install these. So we click the download button. And we're gonna click open. Double click the folder. Click on the package installer. I accept the terms, install, yes. Click finish. Okay, so that's the 10G driver. We'll click the, install the Bluetooth one next. Open. Okay, we'll open the Bluetooth drivers and click Intel Bluetooth. Next, I accept the terms. Next, and we'll just go for a typical install. Install, yes.
click finish. Okay, Intel network drivers next. Open. Okay, we can just click on the auto run. Uh, install drivers and software. Yes. Next. I accept the terms. Next. Next. Install. Okay, finish. And the Intel Wi-Fi drivers. And we're going to extract all. Click on the wireless setup. Next, I agree. Install, yes. Okay, finish. Okay, so that's the first lot of LAN drivers installed. Um, we've got an M4 RAID driver. I'm not going to install that because I'm not going to be using that. There's an AMD chipset driver. Although we need this, I prefer to get it from AMD's website directly because it tends to be more up-to-date version. There's onboard VGA drivers. Um, again, if you're going to use a CPU with integrated graphics and plug your cables directly into your motherboard rather than a graphics card to your monitor, you're going to need this. Um, we're not going to need this because we're using a dedicated graphics card. We'll get our drivers for that uh, directly from NVIDIA. Um, and then we can install the audio drivers. So we're going to have to restart our computer, so we'll go ahead and do that now. Okay, so we'll head over to AMD's website and get the chipset drivers. Again, I'm going to put links to all this in the description, so don't worry about finding them. Um, so we've got the chipset driver for X570. And we're going to click on Download. Run. Okay, I'm going to have to restart. Okay, next thing to install is the drivers for our graphics card. So it's made by NVIDIA, so we head over to their website. Although you can get the drivers separately, I prefer to install the GeForce Experience because it'll update things automatically for you. So we'll click on Download Now and Run. And again, I'll put links to this in the description.
Okay, so if you have a, an account, you can go ahead and log in. If not, create one. Okay, so we click on drivers. Okay, we need to select our preference of driver. So NVIDIA offer two different types of drivers. There's game ready drivers or studio drivers. So if you're gonna use your PC more for gaming, click the game ready drivers. If it's more for content creation, click the studio driver. I'm mostly for content creation, so I'm gonna select the studio driver. And then there's a new version available, so I'm gonna click download. Okay, ready to install. I'm just going to click Express Installation and Yes. And expect the screen to flicker during the installation. This is normal. It's just as the graphics card drivers are being installed. Okay, so to complete the installation, we're just going to need to restart. So I'm going to click Restart Now. Okay, so that's all the programs and drivers installed that we're going to need for our PC to actually function. But to make it look good and allow us to control the RGB, there's two more bits of software that I would recommend installing. So we head back over to MSI's page. And instead of drivers, which we've been downloading before, we're going to click on Utility. Select uh, Windows 10 64-bit. And we want to install the MSI Creator Center. And we're going to click open. Double click on the creator center. Okay, so we go ahead and look for this then. There's creator center, so we click on it. Click OK. Click continue. Click run. Yes. Okay. And next. Accept the license terms. Next again. And then install. Finish. And then if we head back over to the creator center. It's now recognized that we've installed this and it's going to continue on with the installation. This one takes quite a while to download and install. Okay, so to control the lighting on our motherboard and the devices that are connected to it, we go to Mystic Light. Okay, so in here we're able to change the RAM and the motherboard LEDs. So we're in the motherboard at the moment and we can select which of the components we would like to change. So for example, there's the I.O. cover. If we select it, um, at the moment all the lights are currently set to rainbow. Um, I like to have them all set to white, so I can do that all in one go, or I can change them all individually. So let's go and select them all. Select all. And let's pick a steady color. Let's drag this all the way up the top to get white. And then hit apply. Okay, so that now has set all our fans. Um, the pump head because it's plugged into one of our RGB headers has gone to white as well and the only thing left for us to adjust is the RAM. So if I go into the RAM it's currently set to rainbow so again I'm going to select a steady color drag all this all the way up the top to select white and hit apply. Okay, and the RAM is now turned white as well. So obviously you don't have to pick white, you can pick whatever effect you want. You've got a whole range of different effects in here. Um, and one of the best things about this is you can control the RAM as well without having to use additional software. Okay, so while we're looking at the RGB, it's probably a good opportunity for me to show you how the front panel RGB works using the buttons on the case. So we've got two buttons on the top of the case. We've got one marked color and one marked M. 
Um, the color one has seven color modes, so if I press it, it'll cycle through the seven different static color modes. The M mode has more dynamic RGB effects. So if I press it, it has seven of these modes. The eighth time I press it, it will then switch over to sync with the motherboard. So my motherboard's currently set to white, so the eighth one should take me to white. So there's plenty of great looking effects here. So that's the eighth press. So that is now whatever our motherboard was set to is coming through the front of the case. And also because we've wired this up to the front controller, the white strip as well. So that's what I would leave it to. I like it in white. If we want to turn the lights off altogether, we need to hold this M button in for three seconds. And that will turn off the lights. So again, the front lights have gone off and the light strip at the front has gone off because this is what we've got connected up to the front controller. To turn it on again, I just need to press the M button again for three seconds. Okay, so as I mentioned, the only thing we can't control at the moment is the lighting on the graphics card. It's currently set to white because I had it set to white in my last build, so it fits at the moment where what I want it to look like. But if we want to change it, we're going to need to download some software from ASUS's website. So we head over to ASUS, Drivers and Utilities. We're going to select our operating system, Windows 10 64-bit. And then in Utilities, we're going to click Show All. What we're looking for is the Aura RGB Lighting Control for Graphics Cards. So we're going to click Download. Okay, so we can go ahead and open the application. Okay, so at the moment we're set to static and white, but we can select any lighting effect that we want. So we can go, let's go to color cycle and click apply. Okay, but I prefer it much just set to white, so I'm gonna go back to static, white, Again, you want to change the static color, you can do it in the color wheel. But I'm going to bring it back to white and hit apply. Okay, so we've now got the PC looking the way I want it to. There's a few more things we need to do before we're finished. Um, for starters, I want to check the RAM speed. Um, I'm almost certain it won't be running at the full 3600 megahertz it can do. Um, I want to have a look at the fan curves to see how the fans are running. Um, other things I've mentioned, the M.2 Expander card, I want to show you how to set it up. Although I don't have it in the system at the moment, I'll show you the setting you would need to change in the BIOS to get it to work. And the last thing I want to do is you'll probably notice down the bottom there's quite an annoying red light. There's an indicator light and a code at the bottom. I like to turn that off so that it doesn't interfere with the rest of the RGB effects. So we'll head over to the BIOS and I'll show you how to do that. So what we need to do is we need to restart the PC. While it's restarting, the very first moment the logo comes up on the screen, we hit the delete key. Alternatively, you can keep pressing the delete key as your computer is restarting and it will load into the BIOS. So restart.
So if I can just keep pressing the delete key now, or I can wait until the logo comes into it, either way. There's the logo appeared, I hit delete, and we're into the BIOS. Okay, so let's start off with the memory. So if I click over on memory, so it's showing up that we have 64 gigabytes of um, RAM, but it's currently running at 2133 megahertz. We can see down here we've got XMP profiles. Profile 1 is what we want, 3600 megahertz. So we just need to turn XMP on. Okay, so that's done. That's the first step. The next step I was going to mention was to get rid of that little indicator light down the bottom. So we can do that by turning off the indicator LED. It's not going to go off just at the moment. We're going to actually have to um, save the settings and exit before it will make the changes. Next thing to do is to show you where you're going to have to adjust the settings for the M.2 expander card. We need to click on advanced up the top here. Go to settings, click on advanced, PCI subsystem settings. And at the moment, we need to configure the PCIe lanes. Um, PCIe 2 is showing up because we've got a graphics card plugged into it. If we did have our M.2 expander card, PCIe 5 would also be showing up here. And you can see over on the right-hand side of the screen, it's giving us some advice here. Um, PCIe lanes configured for M.2 expander. Um, and what we want to do is set them to 4 plus 4. So I can go into 2 at the moment, set the auto, I have the option to change them. We've got 16 lanes on PCIe slot 2. PCIe slot 5 has 8 lanes and we'll want to turn them on to by 4 plus by 4. So unless you do that, it won't show up in Windows. So you'll need to do that if you're using the M.2 expander card and it has to be installed in PCIe slot 5 like we did when I was showing you how to build. Okay, so last thing to do then is to have a look at the fans and check they're running the way I want them to run. So we click on the settings. Okay, so we'll work our way through. So we've got our CPU fan, which is actually the three fans plugged into the AIO in the triple splitter, plugging into the CPU fan header. So they are currently set to PWM, they're four pin cables, so that's what we want them to do. And they're using smart fan mode, and they're adjusting off the CPU temperature. So that is exactly how I would have it, I wouldn't make any changes there. So pump one is our pump fan header. What you can see at the moment, it is set to PWM. Now that fan header um, has four pins, but the cable that we plugged in only has three pins. So if you leave it in that current mode, it's going to run at 100% speed. So that is designed to run in DC mode. So we'll, turn, we'll click DC for voltage control. I do tend to leave the pump running at full speed anyway. So I'm not going to use the smart fan mode where it would adjust the pump speed. Um, depending on the curve fan curve. So you can see there the pump speed is falling and it's going to go on that fan curve. Again, I can't notice any difference in noise with that reduced. So I'm just going to leave it running at 100% in DC mode. Okay, so then we have five system fans plugged into system one, two, three, four, and five. So we'll have a look at those. So again, they're currently set to DC mode. So I'm going to change them to PWM. I am going to enable smart fan mode and they're working off the CPU. So I'm just going to repeat the same for each of those fans. I 
and that's because the Corsair fans have four pins they can run in PWM mode. System fan five. Okay, we don't have anything plugged into system fan six and seven and our chipset fan. One of the nice things about this is it only really kicks in whenever things are set excessively high. So it rarely it makes any noise. I have another motherboard where the fan is whining away at all the times. So this is quite a good motherboard. And you can see it's currently zero revs per minute. Okay, so that's everything set just the way I want it to. So to save things, we just press the X button at the top. X again. It's showing us the changes we've made, asking us to save configuration and exit. So what have we done? We have set pump fan one from PWM to DC. Um, smart fan mode has been enabled in each of the system fans and we've changed them all from DC mode to PWM. We have turned off the LED indicator light and we've enabled XMP on our RAM. So we're going to go ahead and click yes. Obviously if we had to change the M.2 expander card uh, settings it would be here as well. So our computer now should just reboot into Windows. So what you'll notice, you look at the PC, those annoying red lights down the bottom have now disappeared. Okay, so I think you'll agree that looks much better. Okay, final thing to do is check our RAM is running at 3600 MHz. So right click on the Windows icon and go to Task Manager. We're going to click on More Details. We're going to click on Performance and we're going to click on Memory. And we can now see the speed of the memory is 3600. Okay, so that's the build complete. The PC is now running and looking just the way I want it to. So hopefully you find this video useful. If you have, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel to be notified about future videos. As well, I've already got lots of great PC content on the channel, so make sure to check that out as well. Thanks for watching.